So this is what I just started. Yeah, supply chain 20 years ago. Yeah, the textbook, if they ever exist, seems like being pretty simple and straightforward. Okay, um, just um, uh, three tier supply chain. You got suppliers, you got uh, retailers, and then customer. Okay, and information and the material for kind of straightforward. All right, and then um, not before long, that um, yeah, it's coming to this uh, uh, industrial. Uh, um, revolutions and we have this force and it's pretty much yeah this IOT things yes yeah, things are getting connected back in the time when I was with my dad's yeah the home factories that we are like prior to this yeah because this thing about it one man um, in Taiwan's in uh, in Asia and there are lots of the small um, uh, family business yeah that kind of surrounding like that so we kind of live frogging a big time into this and how does that change? Again, uh, my talk will be surrounding yeah, supply chain operations that's outside the four walls of uh, organization. So this is what I getting in. So yeah, by the time that I um, graduated, got my PhD, this is how supply chain look like. And uh, you can see that there's no textbook uh, attempt to draw so yeah, how supply chain is like this day. Because I mean, when I first drawing it, I was just like, mm, well, it seems like impossible. It's going to be clouded as a whole uh, space because yeah, there are all different things coming along. You got online brick and mortars and customer from all over the places, mobile. Yeah, my kids' generations, yeah, this is something they are very, very used to. Um, so, and what we're doing is yeah, pretty much every of the link, yeah, we can come up with uh, abstract mathematical model to see the impacts yeah, about how different uh, supply chain structures going to affect, yeah, uh, impact the bottom lines of uh, each of the different entities in the supply chain. Okay, so this is what we are facing. And, but I think the key is, yeah, to put it in a, a more positive uh, value propositions is to look at instead of just supply chain is more, more or less a very supporting type of role Think about the value chain because a lot of this thing coming up, not because of you like to supply things. It is because yeah, they are value to what delivering. Yeah, that's where like uh, Amazon setting up selling books on the internet. Yeah, that's a value like um, propositions that uh, Jeff Bezos had that in mind and turned him into uh, nowadays the world's uh, richest person uh, in the world. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with some like interesting use cases. Yeah, um, at a high level. So um, this is actually, um, both, are, both of these are Amazon pictures, uh, they're warehouse pictures. Yeah, I set up with yeah, um, this um, tow cards of king. Yeah, so it's kind of very inefficient when you do this type of, and that's where when i uh, doing my masters uh, to figure out the pickup time um, for particular orders and an average yeah, waiting time as well. So, a um, study has shown that on average, not, um, prior to in introducing robotic yeah, picking, is on average click to ship. And I don't know about your experience. Click to ship time is when um, you make the order online, and by the time the order is ready for shipping, yeah, that type of thing, average about 16 minutes prior to the introduction of robotic, the IoT enabled uh, technology. Once this got introduced, yeah, uh, nowadays if you like to cancel Amazon order, yeah, it would be really, really hard. Yeah, mm -hmm. after 15, so this, kind of, uh, this is back in uh, 2016, the average is about 15 minutes. Yeah, they can get yeah, from click to ship. Yeah, that's, so um, there are things that these days, um, because of IoT um, technology, and the things that happening is that, um, back in the time is that the human beings go into uh, pigs, wherever in the warehouse, the order, and you can utilize today, like we have this um, AR, augmented reality, yeah, to help you out with that, but still it's very labor intensive. And um, the later invention, 2000, uh, 2003, the company was founded, called Kiva, and Amazon bought it at uh, big discounts, yeah, bargains upon that, uh, 2013. So they have robots actually move, yeah, all this uh, shelf into the picker. So the picker actually stays stationary and picking the thing, just yeah, right, um, uh, your surrounding. So that actually increasing the efficiency big time. And some statistics shows that um, it could increase the inventory storage by 50% with the same um, footprints that you have. And that's the big thing this day because again, um, all this one day, two day shipping or same day shipping require facilities like warehouse facilities be very, very close to the customer. And you know, like, as closer to the customer you are getting um, to the urban area, it's very, very expensive. 
yeah, for the uh, real estate. So uh, to have like 50% more uh, of capacity using the same warehouse is amazing. So um, the average es estimated saving is about 20% on operating costs. And you can think about why Amazon is saving big time up on this. Yeah, Amazon 20%, wow, that's huge, right? And they bought it uh, less than a billion, so it's quite a bargain that what they're getting out of that. All right, <laughs> this is another thing. I, I think, yeah, um, uh, in, in my childhood, I'm still seeing a lot of this. Yeah, this day on the left-hand side, the traditional um, fountain drink uh, dispenser. Yeah, it's just something like that, pretty cool. Back in my time when I was kids, yeah, Coca-Cola, this foreign brand, even so luxury is that for us to have. I remember like um, there was, um, <laughs> I was giving the joke that McDonald's is a big thing when I was uh, in Taiwan. I, if we, um, when we are in, in high school, when we, when we go dating, we, we, uh, we took girlfriends, yeah, to, to McDonald's, yeah. Um, so this is something that you don't come along that often. But here in the state, um, yeah, it's kind of street foods, yeah. Um, so they now have actually introduced this for quite a few years, 2009, uh, 2009. that has been 10 years already. Um, the effect of this is like it has, a in, I won't say in, infinite, but um, I think last time I checked, 33 different drinks that can offer with 15 flavors. Uh, if you do the calculation, that's close to 500 possibilities. Uh, beyond that, I think it's the data behind the thing because um, they kind of see how customers are using the machine for. And it turns out there's a particular one that get attention yeah, to the customer, but I don't know for what reason, Cherry Sprites. Okay, and all LeBron James, okay, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to phrase it. LeBron James actually on the commercial and yeah, promoting, yeah, this cherry Sprite flavor. And they come out of nowhere because otherwise in the, in the old traditional way, you would take, I don't know, like a uh, hundred of this type of machine, all different kind of flavors, pre-mixed. This is actually like the kids, yeah, they just improvise yeah, on spot. My kids are always trying something different every time. And you can actually have a, the QR code. Last time I tried it, the QR code wouldn't work, but you, if you use the app, you can actually use your mobile phone to customize your drink. So they got the data uh, up on that, how people like using that. Um, all right, this is the last one I would like to talk about before getting into the real uh, academics, the are uh, more serious stuff. So again, this is the thing that yeah, kids kind of like, and back in a time that, yeah, um, I can still, like plenty of people are using it in this fashion, is um, this smart uh, magic band. Yeah, so if you are li living the resorts, uh, um, Disney resorts, that they will give you a band. Yeah, uh, just like a smartwatch type of thing, but it has this RFID active uh, RFID, so that's, yeah, you actually, uh, it has the pass, it has your credit card information, so the, the benefits of this, first of all, data. And second of all, you are spending more, okay? And kids like doing this thing. So um, it's kind of equivalent of all this fast pace, um, uh, lots of information, sitting in, um, just kind of the same thing, just, yeah. But um, uh, keep tracking of the information, so where you're about, and um, all those type, yeah. So, so the next couple of slides I'm gonna put together um, what the big three uh, management consulting firms have find out. So the big threes are McKinsey, uh, BCG and uh, a band. So these are slides going to talk briefly about the opportunities, the challenges, and um, what are the trends going on. So if you look at how IoT has been happening for the past few few years, they, they did um, this big three. They've been doing survey, white papers as well. So what they find out first of all, where are the opportunities? Um, down on the horizontal axis, these are the vendors' uh, priority. So this is something they think their um, technology is uh, mature enough and they would like to kind of mass uh, produce or like implementing, uh, deploying uh, this type of technology. So it's something that you can see manufacturing quality control kind of link back to what John was talking about, the sensor, lots of sensor things that you can see how things are going. Um, when IoT just first started in the area, pre um, Predictive maintenance uh, is a, something big um, for the uh, for the field, and later I'm going to talk about why it, it is not getting as much attention as the others. It's mainly because of the data, the excess of data. If you think about how much data will be produced during the production process versus how many failures that you're going to observe for the predictive. So um, 
I think what they find out is the, um, the investments um, return is not as high as expected as the others. It takes a couple of years uh, for you have to have enough data because when you run uh, statistics regressions, if you've got only two points, yeah, that's no help. It's just connecting the two dots, right? Uh, when you have starting having a lot of more data, and that's where like on a daily basis you put it, uh, produce batches or batches of yeah, productions that you have learned quickly. Yeah, if, if you have to wait until things fail, oh yeah, I collect one data point, that's thing, something I don't want to get into. Yeah, it would take quite a few years yeah, to have some reasonable data uh, to begin with. So there are other applications and something that um, customer on the vertical axis is some customer really wants, yet uh, vendor haven't yet quite um, been into this area yet. Um, so, for example, the energy uh, management of building, I think it's like getting uh, into traction these days. Um, this is a survey done, most of the survey I put out are done in 2018. These are the most recent ones for the, the big three. And the reason I like the big three is um, they are the, um, the leading consulting for the big Fortune 500 companies. So they kind of tell you, and the survey is like, um, as you can read, yes, yeah, 182 uh, big Fortune 500 companies. So it kind of represents, um, yeah, kind of the big chunks of the, the industry. All right, so what are the challenges? So we look at the opportunities. What are the challenges? Uh, from the survey, we start executive, yeah, um, supervising or advising this IoT projects. The top one is security, okay? Um, and again, there's lots of hacking things that we have been seeing. So what on average they find out is um, if you are, the, you are the vendor, credible vendors, but have better security, uh, on average they pay premium, 22% 20, more premium in terms of price implementing, implementing project just for security reason. Yeah, because that would have a big consequences if you cannot get it right. Um, the second thing is IT and OT uh, integration. Uh, IT, yeah, that's what uh, the IT that we know of, uh, information system. OT is operating technology, so that's what uh, John was about, how to integrate the two things together. Okay, that's the second challenge. And the third one is unclear ROI. Things are taking years, yeah, some time for this uh, thing to uh, get into traction and enough um, clear returns. So these are the top three challenges. I have been like, um, they did the previous survey back in 2016, and the top three has remained top three um, for the past. And there are something like kind of getting more attention these days. All right, so if we look at more particularly how uh, different companies are approaching it differently, and uh, especially the difference between the successful ones and the legacy ones in the, um, in the field. So the way that McKinsey uh, in the survey, again, 2018, that defined the leader is that they get these returns uh, in terms of cost savings or additional values that is greater than 50%, they characterize those as uh, projects or companies as leaders. And those who are not successful, less than 5% in terms of return as Lakers. And there are quite a big difference uh, in between those that just, um, yeah. Uh, classify as others. But what is the following analysis just try to contrast what are the different things these two type of companies uh, did uh, to realize this. Um. So the first thing is really pretty interesting is um, it, it turns out um, the successful turns uh, firms, they utilize more existing offerings. So they don't build things from scratch. So if you look at that, um, the, the first thing is that add connectivity, IoT capability to companies' existing product. This is where like, this, uh, the leaders tend to do more and the followers tend to do less, yeah, because they are focusing on the new IoT technology. And while the leading firms are staying with existing but just kind of enriching the feature, uh, adapting this new connectivity uh, IoT things. Again, so we're getting to something later that's the use cases, so some learning curve, yeah. You don't want to risk into investing something big. Um, and yeah, it's just kind of a hit or miss type of thing. So um, yeah, so if you take the average, it's probably uh, a, a bit risky uh, if you want to like to do that uh, in that fashion. So that's the first thing uh, being observed. Leader tend to uh, apply the IoT yeah, into existing um, offerings. The other things, um, um, difference between the leaders and the leaguers, is the business process changes, okay? You want to take things to the next level, you just cannot focus on the product offering. You have to do something differently. 
along the way that they're delivering the, uh, the service or the product. So leaders actually, they change their business process. Okay, so the IoT does not just, uh, in one aspect, give a different um, capability to the product. It also can change the process along the way as well. So we'll talk about that uh, later on down the road. All right, um, the third one is about use cases. This is kind of steep learning curve. So what they observe is, um, if you do more uh, in terms of the IoT projects, your average returns, yeah, would increase. Okay, so if you like kind of just only having a few use cases to pilot it, yeah, there are lots of, I mean, the, the way to take about this is um, a lot of upfront investment in infrastructure. So, I mean, you know, like, if you do this IT, uh, IoT projects, you need to have a good uh, IT infrastructure, the data things. That's back in my time when I was doing IT consulting. Yeah, the data is a big thing. So um, to, to be able to harvest, yeah, you, it takes quite a few projects in order to get to this phase. And that's where, like, um, it may take years um, and a, scope, a big scope of um, what you need to do in order to reach that. And if you go, so they, I don't think they're, they're enough, yeah, uh, example, but when, when things are getting like really complicated, like you, you're taking too, too many projects, yeah, it thing can go, go down a bit. Uh, but again, a steep learning curve, and that's all kind of tied in with the collaborative as well. So hopefully, yeah, with collaborative, yeah, we can bypass all together, kind of learning from the process, and we all can land in, in this, yeah, uh, Play-Doh parts, um, harvesting a uh, bigger return. So the last things about the findings, uh, there are more of this, but the last one is the CEO champions. Um, and it's going back to the, uh, the previous one is, yeah, it, it takes lots of effort, sometimes years, uh, for this thing to materialize. So um, if you have only very myopic yeah, agenda for this, it will kill this thing uh, as pil uh, pilot project. And that happened a lot yeah, in, um, in operations uh, project in, uh, implementation. So they are comparing between, the, again, the leader and the leaguer. Uh, the CEO involvement in this, uh, being a champion is very important. I've been to uh, lots of uh, uh, IT implementation projects uh, previously before I joined academia, and even uh, when I become uh, professors, I, I help out with some project management too. And I can see the difference when you have a CEO champion um, yeah, projects that will ha have a huge difference. Again, like John was talking about this uh, deformations, um, the third wave of uh, technology. It would take years if you want to yeah, look into it as companies to support that. It won't be like in a year or something, you, you'll be able to commercialize that. So those things actually would take uh, some time and quite a bit of collaboration to make it happen. So um, yeah, my personal encounter as well. I sometimes run into projects and when I talk to the CEO, he has a different agenda. And I was like, okay, if that's your agenda, I'll change accordingly because that's how it's gonna make things happen. All right, so I think I got two, three more slides to, to wrap it up. This is what something that McKinsey summarized after the survey. These are the trends, um, but in academia, we like to um, find out principle instead of yeah, enumerating all possibilities. So the things I'm gonna highlight are like uh, opportunities, business opportunity, uh, different models, access to data, and finally, cloud edge uh, um, IoT environments. But you can get all this yeah, from the uh, McKinsey report. Um, I can provide a link later on. So this is something pretty much I would like to use to summarize the talk and um, later use a very simple um, trade-off picture to, to show you this. So I kind of break it down into three pieces. First of all, think about value-adding opportunities, okay? So with IoT, so many companies are nowadays, yeah, if you have the IoT, in addition to just the product itself, the data could be of valuables, yeah, so, um, just think about that, yeah, Amazon, why they are thinking about uh, coming to open up another type of grocery store, after, even after acquiring Whole Foods. Um, and they have this big online presence because they don't know what typical people would buy in Walmart. Yeah, they, don't, they wouldn't be able to capture that, uh, that, uh, that group of people. So that's where actually um, uh, Walmarts or companies, yeah, if you have this IoT, you can kind of, um, digitize the physical world, you, you can have different type of information that actually can be an asset to you. Okay, different customer experience as well, like going back to the business um, uh, example. 
yeah, the tech things. And that's yeah, in addition to just um, pretty fancy, uh, you actually increase the consumptions, yeah, on average between 20 to 30 percent. Also, the product designs and developments, yeah, you kind of now know better about what customer wants, like the type of feature. If you think about software, so there are things that, yeah, you can take it back. And next time I'm designing um, my software, my game, for example, what are the features that, because this, this is just like used very little by the user, so maybe when I take it back in, in designing the next um, generations of product, I can take the inputs from how people are using that. So make it simpler. So all in all, I mean, another thing I, I would say is try to, to, to simplify to a certain extent so that you can leverage. Um, as a way that if you think about um, now we have the data, it seems like getting things a little bit more complicated. If you want to be agile, you have to simplify some other specs so that you can react more quickly. Because if you can save big time, one of the things that IoT about is like a real time information. But if it takes forever for you to react to that, yeah, it won't be as much useful. Say, for example, if say you from weeks to days for the information gathering, but it still takes months for you to deliver, yeah, it won't help you as much because as the proportions, yeah, you can see that they only cut down that small portion. So the same thing, that's what I just talked about, the uh, product, about the process as well. So there are new type of process of um, uh, business model you can deliver. Instead of selling product these days, many companies are selling product services, okay? So they try to gear towards, okay, there are certain service level, for example, lighting, okay? You can sell light bulbs, okay? So like um, GE Lighting, now under a different name, they have diff two different divisions. One is to take care of your lighting needs for big corporates. So what they do is that, yeah, they would do all the um, replacements and whatever. You just tell me what kind of things that you want, okay? Um, but they kind of spin off also the, the consumer light bulb business. That's a commodity type of business, very, very difficult. Even like you incorporate IoT, but that is really very traditional. That's, uh, that's actually my next picture we talk about. There's only so much you can do on a single light bulb. Yeah, and again, when you go crazy, like kind of different colors, telling you time, talking to you, I think that's mixing out of it, yeah. I'm going to scale my, my grandma a big time, yeah. When you have a light bulb can talk to you, right? All right, so different type of business model. Yeah, uh, on-off versus recurring. And then we are talking about this retainer type of uh, product service combination. And again, simplify business model, you want to react based on the data you gather, and that make your supply chain more efficient, more agile. And the very last thing is about how supply chains coordinate. Uh, and I kind of like to talk, uh, call it like value chain. Think about this kind of additional values that IoT can bring to you, instead of thinking about like supplying, 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 because you have to think about like from a different perspective. So one thing is data sufficiency and access. Um, this has always been a challenge because for IoT, yeah, you, it is the main thing is about data generation. But the thing about data is that along the supply chains, actually 80% of the data lie outside of like organization. And how do you actually, even you have IoT, if you not open it up, you still have challenge in me accessing, yeah, um, um, my downstream, yeah, customers uh, use it. So if you look at um, what Coca-Cola is doing, Previously, he ki they kind of have to go through this tier uh, of supply chains and then, okay, Wendy's ordered this much, Burger King ordered this much, whatever for the fountain drink, okay, from me. I have no visibility how end customers are using my product. There's no way I'm going to know that, yeah, Cherry Sprite would be a popular product because no, no vendors, I mean, um, no fast food restaurant is going to order that because that's not going to happen anytime soon. So they won't be able to find out that. So think about this is how are you going to uh, start from cooperating into collaboration? I think kind of, um, kind of tie in the ends of collaborative. Yeah, if you think about the supply chain structure, uh, eventually you want to move into more collaborative yeah, operation where that you don't need that much of in information in between because people will think about it's easier and easier to get information, data this day. But it's still, insights, it's still very kind of time consuming <laughs> to clean up the data. So for example, if you can leapfrog and then cooperating, have a um, uh, 
I don't know exactly how they do the contract, the uh, Coca-Cola uh, with Wendy, those fast foods. But one thing you can do is a, uh, a revenue sharing type of um, business. So I can take over that. You don't, you don't need to order anything. All you need to uh, ask me is that to be sure about like 95%, this machine will be on and functioning with all the drinks flavor available. Okay, and that type of relationship, yeah, I have to kind of break it out. I don't, I don't do the traditional ordering. You do everything as a service for me. And that take um, a little bit of, yeah, um, creativity to, to make that things happen. So all the way from cooperating, everyone is compromising up on something to think something more positively. So I can get you out something that really that's not your core competence. It's like why Wendy would like to make drinks even better. Like they have something already. So just uh, writing up on, yeah, uh, Coca-Cola. So simplify relationship as well. So this is the last slides I have. Um, a lot of things we find out actually can be, yeah, this is kind of guiding principle in operation and supply chain. You can only do so much. If you want to drive 100% for pretty much all the technology, it has like kind of the plateau you're going to hit eventually. And the, the returns are actually diminishing to what, but the cost for achieving, see, 100% visibility, it's impossible to, to get there even, to even think about that. So that's where like, you, you see there's a lot of collaboration happening. And one thing you might wonder, like, how don't you just kind of start in front here, zero, and go all the way, eventually going to find a maximum profit. The thing is for IoT, you have a lot of upfront investment to do. You don't just go this incrementally. You actually have to like zero or maybe 30% or something, or like even passing that. So a lot of learning along the process where like the collaborative actually would help out in that sense is that there are some phases that if you have multiple use cases, going to bypass joining together and then getting to um, the later phases a little bit easier without that much of effort investment to put up front. Okay, and a value proposition we talked about on the previous slides as well. If you only think about how to make the current product richer and richer, that's only so much you can do. Our existing process, you only do it on the existing ones. You can only hitting like at certain points, yeah, the, the return. Again, our phone is getting crazier and crazier, but yet my wife, yeah, still I like, say, why do I need the next iPhone? I, I, I barely use a 20% of iPhone capability. You can keep adding, but the customer would not be willing to pay. Yeah, like that's a month of effort you're putting, uh, uh, renovating yeah, the products. Um, so what do you want to think about how to provide a different services? And Apple is doing something like that along the line. I talked to the retail uh, staff. Yeah, Apple is thinking about changing into a service company. 80% of their revenue will be coming from services instead of hardware because it's harder and harder even for Apple this day. All right, I think that's kind of wrap up my um, uh, presentations and I'll Thank you. Thank you.